Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the UKRI Net Zero Series webinars. Um, just for your information, this session is being recorded, and if you go to the UKRI's um, site, you can find access to all the previous webinars in this series, which we'd thoroughly encourage you to do. And my name is Amy Peace. I'm the Innovation Lead for Circular Economy at Innovate UK, and today's session is on sustainable supply chains. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of that topic and obviously with a nod to circular economy, since I have the honour of being the chair of this session. And then we've got a series of excellent speakers across a wide range of um, different sectors. We're going to give you a bit more insight to their area. And these are all from things which we've either supported directly as UKRI or on topics where we really want to inspire you to innovate further. So we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So we'd ask you if you've got any questions as we go along, can you put them into the Q&A box, which you'll see on your Zoom screen, usually at the bottom. The chat box will be open, but just as I say, just use that for sort of general sort of commentary as we go along, but keep your questions to the Q&A box. Okay, so off we go. So why are we talking about sustainability and supply chains? What's this got to do with net zero? Well, sustainability, I like to think of as being more obvious when it goes wrong. And obviously, plastics have really come to people's attention as being something that's gone wrong when things end up in the wrong place. But it's also about the value of those materials and those products. And if we're just throwing them away, we've lost that value. So you've probably got quite a lot of valuable resource just in your office desk drawer. But obviously, sometimes when our supply chains go wrong, we just ship off this material to other countries, their problem to deal with. But we're also shipping off that value. Now, if we had infinite resources on the planet, that wouldn't be a problem. But as you're probably aware, we don't. So it'd be good if we actually retain some more of that. And today, obviously, net zero has been the theme of this webinar. If you've not come across this graphic before, it's an excellent one by Ed Hawkins, which shows each band has been the average global temperature from 1850 at the left to 2019 on the right. Blue is below average and red is above average. I think it's a really good, clear indicator of what the trend is and how this is really such an urgent and pressing issue to address. But what's this got to do with supply chains? Well, my area is in sort of manufacturing and materials. If we look at the UK territorial emissions and for manufacturing, so this is just the stuff that's emitted in the UK. We're between 15 and 30 percent of those greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there's a big ban there because it depends whether you count just what's in the factory gates or whether you count the, sort of the supply industry around it. But when we look for, further into the supply chain, 89 percent of the emissions associated with our demand for manufactured products occurs outside of the UK in our supply chains. So this is materials and parts that go into the products we make in the UK. So things we design and specify in the UK but are made overseas. But equally, the things we demand directly and are made overseas could be made in the UK, but we are responsible by consuming these things for that full supply chain of emissions. Let's go into that in a bit more detail. So say the obvious bit is what do we admit in the factory? But before we even get to kind of combining things into a finished product, we have emissions embedded in the raw materials. That's because it takes energy to dig things out of the ground. It takes energy to grow crops and raise animals. It takes energy to distribute things around. So this is all contributing towards the product's carbon footprint. But it goes beyond that because we're obviously we're creating products for a purpose, for societal needs, maybe mobility, shelter, housing. And if we can make these products better, we can actually influence the energy that is used. I'll just go back. So if we make better insulation, we use less energy in our house. But also the supply chain goes beyond that in terms of life. So we can make things that are easier to take apart. We use less energy at that point. It's the full life cycle that really contributes towards how we're doing on climate change and our progress towards net zero. So where does circular economy come in here? Well, we've had decades of linear supply chains going through materials, parts, products, use and waste, like a badly made toy robot. Circular economy is about looping back, retaining that value of both the materials 
and the carbon, the emissions used to make them. And actually, the closer those loops are, the tighter they are, the less energy often we're using to get back to a usable product. So even just making the battery being able to replace is using a lot less energy than making a whole new robot. And there are various of these loops, which I won't go into. We've got some good examples in the uh, talks we've got today. But most people have really only heard of recycle. But that's often breaking down a product into quite sort of small often, but also sort of quite back to sort of molecular sometimes level before having to go through all that chain again. It's better if we can actually do it without having to get to that level. And I've got one last three on there because each one of these loops is really essentially making things more efficient and a little less bad. But we've had decades of this and actually we need business models and more businesses to look at regeneration which is where you get to be truly sustainable when we leave the planet in a better place than when we found it. So who have we got to talk today? Well, as you can see, a great list of speakers today covering everything from digitalization in high tech areas through to agriculture. Now we're gonna go from talk to talk. Each speaker is going to introduce the next one, approximately seven minutes each. I encourage our speakers to keep to time because we really want about 25 minutes at the end for this Q&A panel session. So again, put your questions in the Q&A session. So our first speaker, Kim Lloyd from Supply View, she's gonna to talk to a lot about digitalization and supply chain, some really good tools there. She's got great experience in both the fast moving consumer goods industries and high tech areas. So over to you, Kim. Thank you, Amy. Um, hopefully Rebecca can put up my slides for me. Um, but what I'm gonna do is focus today on um, uh, an area of sustainability, specifically on resource inefficiency uh, and what can be done uh, about it using tech that absolutely is readily available, whether people are aware about it or not. Becky, have we got my slides? Yeah, they're just coming. Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. There you go. There's, there's me. If we can move forward. Great. So one more slide, if you can move forward, that would be great. So as I said, what I'm going to focus on is really around um, how resource inefficiency or waste, as Amy uh, called it, is really um, uh, causing us a huge issue and what can be done about it. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit first about the background on what's um, causing this. Um, and fundamentally, what we can see, uh, and I see it every day with clients that I work with, uh, with, but also um, in the 25 years of working in direct uh, frontline supply chain. Uh, the key issue that we see is that um, uh, typically um, and historically supply, uh, supply chains are operating within silos, um, not just physical silos, but informational silos. Um, and what that has really created is that um, typically um, uh, companies are then optimizing those silos which may then well um, pass the issue up or down the supply chain. Um, and typically those informational silos are not just happening um, across businesses that um, may be working together within a supply network, but also um, it happens significantly within businesses who are actually um, are operating their own informational landscape. So what that then creates is um, uh, uh, optimization within those um, silos then creates um, inefficiency um, and uh, we then need optimization rules to then allow us to then uh, operate more efficiently, uh, efficiently within that network. Um, and really looking at, well, what is the objective function that we want to run that, um, that network with? Um, and so the key thing that we need to look at, well, what are these the rules that need to be set up um, to take these inefficiencies away. But if I move on to the next slide, we can then look at, well, the fact that these, these rules and policies and parameters are inefficient, um, there are a number of, of factors that then really play out that, that, that um, uh, lead to the resource inefficiencies. And I've got a number of them written here. Sorry, this slide isn't building, which I was expecting it to. So if you look at some of the key efficiencies that you may well see in a, um, a supply chain that really doesn't have well-connected um, information sources, you'll end up having buffers that really then are, are trying to be set up 
to then deliver good service or good cost to serve or, or good inventory within a network. Um, and so what you'll see is that will play out then with that inefficiency of higher inventories um, that customers are trying to, um, uh, uh, well, clients are trying to set up to protect customer service. Uh, you may well ha be having to make emergency logistics movements. So typically clients may be air freighting products across the globe to meet a customer service requirement, or you may well within your factories you're producing longer runs of products um, uh, to optimize your factories that then actually produces way more inventory that you actually need. So you end up producing three, six months worth of inventory um, that is then filling up a warehouse that you're then paying to run in terms of all the energy that it's using to run that warehouse. So as you move down the supply chain, what you're seeing is that if a, uh, a network isn't well connected, you're then implementing the, um, uh, and ri riddling your supply chain with these buffers of inefficiency to enable that network to work. And as I said, this is not just happening within um, businesses within their own supply network, but it uh, is then um, exacerbated as you look at multiple businesses that then don't readily coordinate and synchronize their supply chains and share information. Um, so what that means, if you move to the, um, the next slide, the key thing that we're then looking for is then how do we then um, run our operations where customer demand, inventory and production are working in, in harmony, not just within uh, a, 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 a single supply network, but across an entire landscape. And the answer lies within synchronization and synchronizing the demand um, uh, uh, a flow of your um, product right the way through that network. Um, and this concept is well um, accepted and well understood. Clearly the challenge comes is how do you enable that to happen? Well, the good news is there is technology out there that then does allow you and enable you to do this. So if you could move on to the next slide. And the, the key technology that enables you to do that is developing a digital twin and to developing a digital twin that really allows you to first of all curate data put it in a format that really allows you to then um, understand and see what's happening within a supply network um, and once you can see and get visibility across that supply network you then want to get insight and so you really need all of the good supply chain thinking um, built within the algorithms of a digital twin that gives you insight, gives you diagnostics of what's happening and why across the network. Once you've had have, have that diagnostic, then what a digital twin can allow you then to do is well model. Well, what if give you intelligent design? Well, what if I start looking at different policies and parameters across my network? How can then I improve either the level of inventory I'm holding, the buffers I've got in terms of excess warehousing, or the cost of carbon that may be existing across that network. So you can then play out all of those different scenarios and really pick um, within your network what is the most optimal way to um, run your network in terms of policies and parameters. And then finally, with the digital twin, feed that into your synchronized planning capability across the network. So that, that sounds all good. Um, and clearly, as I've mentioned, to just close off, the tech is out there now, if you move on to this, uh, the next slide. Thank you. So certainly um, within Supply View, the company I work for, we have created a digital twin um, with a product called Carbon View. So that has been a collaboration between industry supply ex uh, chain experts, academia, and obviously supported by um, the UK government to really then allow us to create um, uh, a supply chain digital twin that really allows you then to break out and move away from these, these silos that really are um, causing resource inefficiencies across uh, an end-to-end -end network. And so on that, um, I'm going to now hand over um, to uh, Judith Batchelor, OBE. So Judith works for Sainsbury's. She's a special advisor on corporate responsibility, sustainability and public affairs. Judith, over to you. Brilliant. And uh, thank you very much for that handover, Kim. And uh, I want to say 
first of all, a big thank you for inviting me along to speak today. And, and actually, a lot of what Kim has just talked about, I wanted to echo because this is about um, basically developing um, a, I suppose, digital uh, uh, copy of a physical system that enables you to deal with some of the challenges. And those challenges are many. So on the next slide, please. Um, we have got a food system that whatever lens you choose to look through it, um, it's got challenges. It's got challenges around the plastic pollution we put in the oceans, the freshwater extractions we use for agriculture, and whether it is around um, the number of people that go to bed hungry every evening versus the amount of food that's being wasted. And we do not have um, the, the future um, requirements there in the system that we currently have. So we need to shift the system. Um, and on the next slide, one of the key things that, that this comes to the challenge when we say we need to change the system is how do we define the system? So setting out the scope and, and lots of work has been done on this by lots of different academic institutions to define what the system looks like. But if you don't get this bit right, it will be um, to the detriment of the success of anything that, that comes along afterwards um, because supply chains aren't linear, they aren't straightforward and they are complicated, interdependent, and most of the time that they, um, the way that, that they work is, is not well understood, which is why something like digital twins work so well, because they're able to model those very complex interdependencies. Um, next slide, please. But as well as having a really complicated system, we need to understand um, what creates an enabling environment for the whole system to shift and move together. And again, some of these things are well understood and people will talk about policy, they will talk about fiscal intervention, they will talk about skills, so on and so forth. But again, we never really define um, the caveats and um, what is required in, in the enabling environment to enable the whole system system to shift together. Uh, next slide, please. And if you take on top of those two challenges, the fact that we have got a race to net zero, we're, we're all focused on decarbonisation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and what we can do to basically um, neutralise the 51 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents we produce as a planet. <laughs> That isn't the entire story, because at the same time, we have to think about human capital, we have to think about biodiversity, and we have to think about water and blue carbon, and some of the things that might be coming down the track if we don't manage our ocean environment properly. And that, that for me, is the big area um, that is poorly understood at the moment, because we operate in silos, as Kim has already said, and in those silos, we are not managing those trade-offs. Next slide, please. And for me, I think there are four things that we need from a research and innovation point of view if we are to, to manage those trade-offs. A, obviously we need to be innovative, that's why we're all here. Um, but we need data standards too, some real basics around data standards. We need to understand that we're part of a global food system and we need to create a level playing field so that wherever we are operating in the world, um, we can compare and contrast using what I would describe as the same language and the same currency. And I say that um, predominantly as a retailer because and where we sit in the food system, we can see all the complexity upstream right the way back to primary agriculture or aquaculture. And we see downstream to consumers and what consumers need from us to be able to make more sustainable choices and to be able to manage those trade-offs in their own personal choices, whether it's human health, planetary health, or whether it's um, social capital or, or natural capital. 
Next one. Thank you. So when I talk about innovation, I, I mean innovation in all respects. So what we source, and, and I use the example of the Crop Wild Relatives Programme at Q, um, where they're looking at, for example, climate resistant coffee um, species, and that's something in between an Arabica and a Robusta, but not just what we source, how we source it. And, and much uh, noise is made about palm oil, about soya, about deforestation. Those crops are wonder crops, which is why they've been commercialized, but they haven't been commercialized well. And that's what responsible commercialization is all about. We also need um, to think about how we buy things and what business models look like and some of the things that Kim has just talked about. And also for us, how we sell it and how we present the information about products to customers. And that's absolute information and relative information. Um, on the next slide, thank you. Um, on data standards and reporting, it's not just about data standards on, oh, I've lost, oh, I have lost you. I'm back again, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, thank you. Um, it's not just about um, data standards and reporting. Um, it's about basically how you um, take data from all different parts of the system, pull it all together, and then how you then present that to um, customers. Next one, please. And then we've, uh, we've talked about this and Kim's talked about it from global to local, um, when over half of what we consume comes from somewhere else, and I'm talking about food now, the nuances of geopolitics, climate, nature, people um, are absolutely entwined, which means that any particular location has a unique combination of those things. And therefore, how do we make sure that we do the right things at a global level, as well as doing things at a local level? And at the moment, again, and this is where great digital twins come in, um, there is nothing that ladders up from local to global or cascades down from global to local, because many of the things that we need around interoperability of data and standards don't exist. Next one, please. And then finally, the key to, to helping with all of this is to create that global level playing field. And again, a very crowded space in terms of reporting. And, and whether this is things like the task force on climate related financial disclosures, whether it is what's coming with the task force on nature related financial disclosures, there is a massive amount to bring all of these stakeholders together and to ensure that we can consolidate what we've got into something that is truly this universal language and currency. I am hopeful on this, but I think one of the key things in, in order for this to be able to happen is that the system wants it to happen. And at the moment, there's still lots of initiatives that are being developed when actually what we probably need to do is to consolidate all of that. So I think there is a theme around understanding the navigation and what's out there and bringing that all back into something that is a much more consolidated view um, and what the economics of that looks like. Um, so I'll leave you just with a, a couple of thoughts um, on the last slide, thank you. Um, there's some really uh, interesting things that you can go away and look at and from my point of view, whether it's the UN Food Systems Summit, which is this week, um, whether it's the National Food Strategy, the work that's been done by WWF on bending the curve, um, and, and I say lo lots to read there. So I hope that's been helpful in giving a perspective from my point of view about where innovation is required and, and what could be done. And uh, it's now my pleasure to hand over um, for something um, which hopefully is a good segue to Professor Neil Burgess, who's 
basically chief scientist at United Nations Environment Programme um, at the World Conservation and Monitoring Centre at Cambridge University. So over to you, Neil. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can see me. I've got my camera on. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, zero deforestation supply chains, but slightly from the angle of um, biodiversity as well as the, the carbon side. And also uh, talk a little bit about some of the existing tools um, that we're collectively working on to, to get at this. Now, unfortunately for you, not going to, to read all of these out, but the uh, there is an ongoing policy process to develop a new global biodiversity framework um, that will be agreed in China next year. And there are three targets in that uh, draft framework that relate to both carbon and climate change, but also supply chains for businesses and supply chains for companies. So this is part of the emerging uh, um, support framework at the policy level on the biodiversity side. So as well as the climate, the Paris Agreement, we also have this coming along. Next slide, please. And I'm going to talk about, you know, these kinds of challenges. So this is the global soybean supply chain mapped out. So, you know, lots and lots of soy production in Brazil and USA going to China in this particular case, some coming to the UK, but an awful lot of uh, embedded deforestation in that soybean supply chain. Um, other commodities will come into the UK, also having these embedded kind of deforestation impacts, biodiversity impacts, and social impacts. And so how are we going to get a handle on these at various levels and, and start to measure them and reduce them? Next slide, please. One thing that we're doing inside the, the UKRI funded trade hub is to make a compendium of all the different tools that are available to support business action. So it's not that there is one or two, there are quite a lot and many being made every year. So we're making a kind of a, a platform to allow people to go and look at what they, what tools could they use at the business level to um, reduce their impacts. This is a not finished website, which is why most of it's in Latin, mm. but it will come out soon. Um, next slide, please. Another thing we're doing together with colleagues in the Stockholm Environment Institute is to use work that they've been doing for some year on a, years on a platform called Trace that allows you to basically trace the supply, in this case of soy, from producers through transporting companies to consumers right the way through to potentially supermarkets. So tools like that are being developed. But also they're being developed alongside other pieces of work that, that help countries to look at the overall impact of their, their supply chains. So we have you know, commodity specific supply chain tools being developed and we have country deforestation risk supply chains being developed. So next slide, please. And this is an example of, of one that's being developed by uh, the UK's joint Nature Conservation Committee and the Stockholm Environment Institute together. And you can look at the imported and uh, uh, consumption risks of different commodities. And you can change the, you can toggle for the UK and a different commodity and see where are the deforestation risks in that. And, for, and in the future, also the, the biodiversity risks, and we can add carbon risks in here as well. So. This is a, a tool that helps at the, the national scale to get at these kind of problems. This again is not quite launched yet, but is coming soon and is a UK government product. Um, next slide, please. So that was work that's ongoing to look at the, the, the nation state and the supply chain kind of deforestation risk and biodiversity risk. Within UNEP WCMC, we've been working with the finance sector to also 
um, build tools that helps the finance financiers of the supply chains understand their the risks in, in their supply chains or the risks in companies that they're supporting. This one is called the Encore tool. It gives you a whole bunch of options to look at, you know, what, what sector of the economy and what kind of things do you need to know about and gives you an answer about your the risk that you're facing in your supply chain. Next slide, please. And as well as calculating various things around natural capital, um, including climate, we're adding in a, a biodiversity module as well. So it'll tell you the, the biodiversity risk in your in your supply chain as well. So that's uh, an additional thing for the, the finance sector. Next slide, please. And finally, <coughs> Um, just another another tool that exists, which looks at the the direct on the ground impacts of of sourcing. So if you know where your farms are or you know where your mines are, then you can actually calculate using this tool the the carbon and the biodiversity that you are risking through activities in those specific locations. So this one's also now including a various measures of, of, of biodiversity, including this species threat of abatement and restoration layer, star layer, which is beginning to be used in quite a lot of the, the tools. So there's some commonality emerging on how to measure the biodiversity side. Um, next slide, please. And I have only two slides left. I'll make two points. One, and one is that there are science-based targets network has been existing for a long time for, for climate um, and helping companies to understand what they need to do. There is now one that's parallel to that for nature, which is beginning to advise companies on how do they set targets and measure the impacts for nature as well as the climate side of things. So there's these business facing networks being set up as well to support companies and final Final slide. So my my kind of conclusion is that you know there is a, an awful lot of work going on to create different supply chain tools at the level of companies, supply chains, countries. There's many emerging uh, technologies and tools being developed, uh, including uh, including the biodiversity side of things as well as the carbon side of things. But critically, I think nothing is yet entirely fit for purpose. So it's still an emerging area of technology and, and, and need and need and technology coming together. But it's a very fast moving subject area and something the trade hub is, is actively supporting. And technology companies like Microsoft and Google and others are also now getting involved in this. Um, so I predict this will change a lot in the next two years and we will be able to see you know all the way through the supply chain the impacts on carbon and and nature and and social factors and doing this has you know potentially massive impact on on improving the status quo from where we don't know what what the impacts are to knowing exactly what they are and dealing with them thank you very much i would like to now hand over to dr jeff brightly who's non-executive director of the Renew ELP, sustainability expert with a career spanning 30 years in the environment protection and regulation sector. Over to you, Jeff. Neil, thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation hopefully will pick up on some of the themes that have been mentioned already, not least by Judith about how we make sort of system change happen at uh, some some scale and, and at, uh, in a consistent way. So my focus is on something called chemical recycling of waste plastics. And it's about this development of a new supply chain. So next slide, please. Thank you. So what we're looking at here essentially is this, this new sector that's appearing between the two well-established sectors that don't always collaborate well together and that's the waste sector and chemical production. So chemical recycling is sort of um, zone between a, a you know, established uh, 
partners, as it were, in, in supply chains. But as you can see, the, the waste stream tends to put material into mechanical recycling from a plastic point of view, and it rather cuts out the chemical production side. And what we're looking here, essentially, is how do we join up the, the, the production uh, of plastics at a much higher level and hopefully therefore get better efficiency. So what we're looking at in terms of the waste and chemical sectors, our, our process essentially is a chemical uh, process. So there's a series of different types of technologies in, in place here. One is depolymerization, uh, where you deconstruct a polymer into its monomers. And then the others, for example, pyrolysis or hydropyrolysis, you are, you're heating that hydrocarbon in various environmental conditions, hydropyrolysis through the medium of water. And what that allows you to do essentially is to drive energy into that uh, matrix and it will break up that polymeric material into component parts. And it's possible to, to basically uh, recover and recycle a whole range of different hydrocarbons from those um, secondary wastes, as it were, and contribute to a circular plastic economy. But just take note of that diagram to the right hand side. What we're looking at here is taking material, keeping it within the loop and avoiding it going to energy for waste or landfill and even worse into the environment. But more than that, it's actually about making sure that we retain that carbon in cycle. How do we do that without arriving in the environment? Next slide, please. I wanted to just put up some of the drivers, and I think Judith uh, alluded to some of these things, you know, kind of what's driving your system. So at the top left-hand corner, we have something called the Waste and Resources Strategy, which came out in the end of 2018, and that spawned through the UK Plastics Pact, a series of outcomes and targets that the collaboration under the UK Plastics Pact is trying to achieve. And the targets are basically taking away the plastics that are uh, of, of low use or, or causing impacts on the environment or are problematic. So, for example, the removal of straws and, and uh, cutlery from, uh, from the uh, marketplace would be one example of that. And the ambition, therefore, is to get 100% of all plastic going on the market to be recyclable uh, or compostable or reusable, and that we achieve a 70% recycling rate uh, for those plastics. But also we're bringing in recycled content into those plastics that go onto the market. And there's a bunch of measures that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, such as deposit return schemes, the plastics tax, um, an enhanced collection will be hitting your waste bins by 2026 to make sure that we're collecting more plastic in a more consistent way. And there's a, about over 20 different schemes across the country, which is causing confusion to us all. But I also want to make, make, make clear that, that the target here of 440,000 tonnes of new capacity has to also be reflective of the fact we might not be exporting quite so much, and that's down to things like EU exit and also Global Britain and the issue of Basel Convention preventing plastics being moved around to non-OECD countries. And that's an issue that means that we'll end up processing more of this material at home, and therefore that target may well go north. 70% of a larger target is an even larger target for us to hit. So it's important that we understand these externalities that are also driving that system. And COVID has definitely changed our habits around single use plastic over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, not least through PPE and also buying bagged goods rather than loose goods when we go to supermarkets. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the supply chain, I always feel that this, this has terribly linear. What we're looking at, if we look upstream from where we sit, we need to make sure that the, the plastic economy that's, that's basically providing us with this feedstock, rather unwanted from a societal point of view, but nonetheless want to be dealt with. But we need to be, still be clear about what is it that we want to be able to process. And we can take a lot of different types of plastics, not least the group called polyolefins, this is the material that's largely left over from mechanical recycling. In other words, it's the material that mechanical recyclers can't recycle. Most of that material would normally go to incineration or landfill. Um, if it goes to incineration, we're putting out three tonnes of carbon dioxide um, per tonne of plastic burnt. And so that is you know, a, a, an absolutely massive driver for change for the waste management system. How can we divert this material to beneficial use and recycling? Now, the challenges are clear for us. It is waste but it needs to be at the right specification, uh, the right quality, and therefore um, not damaging our plants, but also getting a high yield coming out the other end of the right quality of material. And also that we are delivering the right quantity. In other words, we can get the material in the right supply. And we're working with a company called Geminor to achieve that. Bear in mind, there are no standards 
for the bail quality that we're looking for. They, there are standards in the European Union that some countries apply to, but we don't have that in the UK, and that would be an optimization step we want to see. But the opportunity is huge. We're actually able to put a value on that plastic waste by converting that into hydrocarbon. Um, and it's much better to pr produce it and, and process that waste rather than export it because we can then get export value and keep carbon in circulation. And also for our own brands, we can now design for chemical recycling. We can work with the brands to optimise their packaging design so that it's more readily recyclable in our process. Because we know that despite all efforts on packaging design, some material will not be able to be mechanically recycled because of contamination or colour or um, other reasons such as format like multi-layer with things like foil attached to it. Next slide, please. So that was upstream. So the implications of looking downstream is what, what the chemical industry want. And I'm delighted to say that there's a very substantial program called Transforming Foundation Industries, which the UKRI and KT and I are running, where if you look down the bottom right diagram, you'll see waste recycling, utilization and symbiosis. The very bottom box is recycle and reuse of plastic and packaging waste. So fantastic. There is a pull now coming from a, a range of customers and we're working with one called Dow, but that's fine. But unfortunately, we still need to meet requirements. We need, before we supply that material into uh, that uh, environment, we also need to be able to um, demonstrate we've achieved something called end of waste. So we're not out of the woods yet in demonstrating that our products are not, uh, are not still waste related. And uh, we have to demonstrate end market demand that we are replacing equivalent substances. And you can see there, our, project, our products from the, the left, from our naphtha and distillate gas oils all the way through to the heavy wax residue at the far right, that they can actually replace existing substances in chemical manufacturing. And that we've also addressed all waste-like properties. So you can see already that we've spanned from waste regulation to chemical regulation. Chemical companies can't take waste products into their processes. So we have to demonstrate that clearly. That puts us in a bit of a bind. But nonetheless, having a supply chain downstream of us that wants our material is great. It creates that pull. And that pull is coming from brands who want to have recycled content in their packaging going forward. And the last slide, please. So, so as a case study, and how do we get that system scale transition? There's a range of um, activities here that we need to put in place. First of all, the waste and chemical regulatory environments need to talk to each other, they need to align. We need to better uh, waste bale quality so we're looking up the system here to ensure that the materials collected from your household is preferentially sent to us to process rather than going in a mixed collection that's then going to be separated out. And there's huge net zero benefits in the waste system for that. The remaining uh, issues are much more about then how do we work with the chemical uh, registrations and make sure that our products are fit for purpose for chemical manufacturing. But overall, there are substantial net zero benefits, not just avoiding energy from waste from um, land uh, and also going to landfill in terms of emissions of carbon, but also the efficiency within the system. If we're able to collect it efficiently, we can process it efficiently, we can supply it efficiently. And therefore, my, my key point here is that the whole supply chain series of partners need to understand their role and look up and look down for the push and pulls from everyone else around them. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And I'd like now to, if I may, hand over to Belinda Clark, who is Director of Agritech East, Europe's largest commercial membership network, collecting farmers, growers and researchers, technologists, entrepreneurs and investors. That's quite a group to connect. Um, Belinda is a graduate from the University of Cambridge, and I'm delighted to see as a trustee of the Royal Norfolk Agricultural Association. And as a frequent attendee of the Royal Norfolk Show, I can say you've been doing a very good job. So Belinda, over to you to talk about digital innovation, agri-tech for a sustainable supply chain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for that great introduction. And I'm going to assume that Amy is going to tell me if I can neither be heard nor seen nor my slides visible. So on that note, I would like to build on uh, something that Judith said and also pick up on some of the points uh, that we've been hearing this afternoon. And what I want to do is to leave you with a sense of an agri-food system that's in a position of change and transition and on a journey towards sustainability. I'm gonna give you a few case studies and some examples and, and hopefully leave you inspired that there are some real innovation opportunities uh, around a sustainable supply chain. 
So uh, as we know, uh, the UK has left the EU and so farmers will no longer receive uh, funding to, for farm support under the Common Agricultural Policy. So the Agriculture Act has uh, stated there will be a transition into a new system of farm support called the Environmental Land Management Schemes or ELMS. And under that, farmers are going to be incentivized under this so-called public goods, public money for public goods, to deliver ecosystem services, which will be around things like carbon sequestration and soils, uh, water management, uh, reduction in waste, things like that. Now, the National Farmers Union has really risen to this challenge and has issued a plan around achieving net zero by 2040, which is really very ambitious. Uh, but they have stated several ways in which uh, they see this happening on farm. So very exciting uh, plan there. And as Judith mentioned, we have the uh, national food strategy. Uh, recommendations have been put forward. And the thing that all of these, and there, there are many others, uh, as we've heard, the thing they all have in common is that they see innovation as a key enabler to enable this to happen. And we have, uh, as I said, things like waste reduction, use of precision agriculture, a trend to more regenerative approaches of food production, and of course, um, changes in consumer choices. Now, I just wanted to have a little word about agritech. So in my view, agritech isn't in and of itself a sector, but it's traditionally been powered by the things that you can see in the top pictures there. So uh, ag chem input, so fertilizers, which we know are absolutely not great uh, for the environment. Machinery, which has been getting bigger and bigger. Uh, plant breeding and new varieties and also animal breeding as well. And then sort of engineering solutions as well. But what's really exciting, and we're seeing this increasingly, is that innovations from other sectors are leaning in to agriculture and they're bringing with them their net zero transition as well. So automotive, aerospace, shipping and maritime and construction are all now starting to see opportunities for agriculture. And one example is uh, a sensor which was originally developed and used in harbours in the shipping industry is now in a glass house in Kent measuring vapour pressure deficit uh, in glasshouse ornamentals in pansies to help them uh, with uh, more efficient water use and keeping the plants uh, growing in an optimum way. So there's some really great opportunities where the work that other sectors are doing in net zero is moving into agriculture and we're seeing this kind of leakiness. Uh, and no doubt there will be solutions from the agri-food system going into some of these other sectors as well. So as we've heard, uh, and uh, a deliberately deceptive value chain here that belies a very highly complex supply chain. And I would invite you just to, let's take an example of, of livestock production, perhaps. If you just think the multi-actor players that need to be involved in reducing uh, the emissions and uh, improving the sustainability of just livestock production. There's the feed manufacturers, the medicine producers, the bedding, the transportation, the facilities in which the animals are living in. So even though we've, I've illustrated those, that value chain and the supply chain actors as being quite tight, it's a very, very diffuse and complex space as we've been hearing from others. And the role of digital innovation as an enabler at every stage cannot be underestimated. We've heard about digital twins and this wheel here illustrates where there are innovation solutions, most of them digital or at least digitally enabled. Uh, and I see that there are kind of three pillars, if you like. There's the, the data piece, which we've heard from Judith, the so-called measure to manage um, approach, enabling communications to connect up that supply chain for just-in-time production, uh, delivery, uh, the right time, maintenance of freshness, for the impact, which is, of course, a more sustainable agri-food supply chain. And the way we look at this is there's really sort of three pillars of a sustainable agri-food. So Judith uh, talked very eloquently about a systems approach. The way we like to look at it is uh, you might have heard of the One Health approach from the WHO. We want to see a One Agriculture approach, bringing in all these different systems and integrating them. And understanding the interdependencies across scales from the, the sort of microscape to the landscape and then to the wider global supply chain, if you like. So ensuring that we're not making decisions at a micro or macro scale that have adverse effects uh, on other elements um, across those, those scales. And then finally, technology for time. Time is a, a major constraint uh, and also a, a driver in, in agricultural productivity and efficiency. And again, being able to increase storage time, shelf life, freshness, using technology, including satellite tech, to be able to 
almost manipulate time uh, across that value chain is, is really crucial. And of course, data, sensors, and those technologies from other sectors are crucial. And this is our stylized insight of what a uh, farm of the future could look like. But actually, it's the farm of today. We are seeing probably all of these innovations, perhaps not on, this, on a single farm, but there are very, very many farms across the UK and beyond who are demonstrating uh, use of a lot of these innovations to improve efficiency and sustainability. And I just want to just uh, highlight a, a couple of case studies where there are businesses that are really rising to this challenge. One of them, uh, Breeder, which is uh, looking to increase efficiency and transparency across the beef supply chain. So by monitoring and managing and being able to have uh, good health records, increasing the efficiency of production and having full traceability, that's actually making more efficient uh, production systems uh, more sustainable. Uh, G's Growers, which is G's Fresh, which is one of the UK's largest salad producers, traditionally overplants uh, lettuces in, a, in, a, in order to be able to meet contract for the supermarkets. But by using their data to be able to manage supply and demand, they can schedule their planting regimes so that they have the right number of lettuces available uh, for when they know there will be peak demand. Oh, sorry, the animation's got a bit funny there. Uh, Live Trace is also a cloud-based solution for fresh produce checking and management around uh, what, what's been happening, the traceability and how uh, the end user, the end grower can start to be able to demonstrate that transparency across the value chain. And then finally, Consus Fresh, another example, pack house and vegetable, uh, vegetable and flower pack house management, label verification, all about being able to build this trust and increase efficiency around sustainability. So the final two words I want to leave you with are around productive and regenerative. Uh, this is the transition that agri-food supply chain is going to reduce uh, soil erosions, to enable production, more efficient production in inhospitable environments, using technology and data coming together around robotics and being able to integrate all these various parameters into single platforms. Judith talked about the interoperability of data cannot come too soon. It's enabling unprecedented insights into the way we view fields and animals and indeed soils uh, by being able to use these different technologies and then being able to marry up the biodiversity agenda alongside that of uh, highly efficient production. We'll probably talk in the discussion session about vertical farming and controlled environment agriculture and its potential role in a sustainability agenda. And then we have these little gizmos that are being used. Uh, this is a, a, a mask from uh, ZELP which goes uh, over cows' uh, muzzles in order to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission. And being able to deploy that technology to increase not just welfare, but sustainability with things like uh, air scrubbers, being able to ensure that the facilities in which these animals are kept are as sustainable as possible for the environment as well as for welfare. And then finally, the latest livestock kid on the block, the black soldier fly. And we can talk again about uh, the role of uh, alternative proteins in the human diet at leading to changing in consumer choice and sustainability. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you for your attention. And it is my great pleasure, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. It's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Urbanovsky. Mark is the innovation lead at UK Research and Innovation, and he's leading on driving the electric revolution challenge. So Mark, over to you. Good morning and um, thank you very much, Belinda, for that introduction and your hugely interesting presentation. Uh, I enjoyed that. Um, thank you, Amy, and the team for inviting me along to talk today. It's a great opportunity to be um, presenting with such a broad range of experts from very many different industries. Um, my seven minutes is um, focused on the supply chain of a specific technology. Um, uh, its manufacturing process and its applications. So driving the electric revolution is a UKRI uh, clean growth and future of mobility challenge. And we're all about net zero and sustainability. And PMD, power electronics, machines and drives are the technologies which underpin um, net zero across transport, energy and industrial sectors. Um, I'm gonna give you a bit more information on what we're doing as a challenge. Um, to develop a sustainable supply chain and how you can get involved. Next slide, please. Oh, back one, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, so uh, 
we are about power electronics, electric machines and drives, PEMD. And as I've said before, um, these are the underpinning technologies for net zero across uh, transport, industrial and energy sectors. We've got 80 million pounds to invest in R&D projects. And we're working closely with industry, academia, research organizations and the government um, to build this supply chain. Um, we're focused on industrialization and manufacturing. We've already got many good universities doing world leading research. What we want to do is manufacture those products here in the UK. Um, and we know we can't do that if we don't have a skilled and talented workforce um, to deliver that. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a, a quick introduction on what we mean by power electronics, um, electric machines and drives. Power electronics, they're your semiconductors, silicon, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, um, that do your um, high power switching. Um, electric machines, a bit more familiar to everyone, these convert your electrical energy and kinetic energy and vice versa in the case of a wind turbine. And drives, these are your intelligent systems that contain your power electronics that um, allow uh, your, your voltage to be converted. Um, we are interested in the whole manufacturing chain and we are looking at all different sectors. Next slide, please. So PEMD, power electronics, machines and drives are in anything. I say we're looking at every sector. This is transport. You've got electric cars, electric planes or hybrid part electric planes. You've got electric cha chains and scooters and bikes uh, off highway yellow vehicles. Um, you've also got um, energy. That's not just wind turbines. It's the power electronics and solar. And, and it's also the whole grid, how that energy is distributed to um, around the country. Uh, your industrial processes, how things are made, this uses a lot of energy, there are um, power electronics and machines in robots and conveyors, um, you've got commercial, this is all your lighting, your, your electric charges, and you've got everyday objects, your phones, TVs, power tools, vacuum cleaners, they all have um, power electronics, electric machines and drives in them. Next slide please. And the, and the whole process to um, manufacture these products um, is, is what we're interested in. We're interested in, in the raw materials, where they're coming from. These are electrical steels, coppers, aluminiums, other metals and, and rare earth elements like magnets. We're really concerned with where these materials are coming from and how they're, and how they're processed. We are interested in turning these materials into components and parts, which uses energy, water, and even more materials, um, uh, how they're distributed, how they're used, and the life of these products, and also how these products are reused and, and recycled, and making sure that the industry is designing for recycling and working on process to extract useful components and materials. We want to keep these materials, as, as I think Jeff said earlier, in this cycle as the waste impacts the environment and sourcing and processing new materials um, impacts the environment further. Next slide, please. So the next um, four slides um, pick out uh, of, of four ways in which the challenge is working on the sustainability of the power electronics machines and drive supply chain. Uh, first of all, it's the obvious one and, and we need to electrify um, transport uh, energy and, and industrial processes um, to reach net zero. The government's got a 10 point plan for this, um, which covers all these different sectors. A, a good example is, is all UK homes need to be powered by offshore wind by 2030. We need PMD in those wind turbines um, in order to power all UK homes. Next slide, please. And, and Building on that, this same point in the 10 point plan um, um, states that the target is 60% of those wind turbines, the content going into those wind, uh, wind turbines needs to be manufactured in the UK. Um, now this um, reduces the carbon footprint of, of products as they no longer need to travel across the globe, but it also gives a boost to jobs, economy and, and sustainability benefits in the UK. Next slide, please. We're also looking at one before that. 
we're also looking at um, improving manufacturing processes. This is reducing the Im embedded carbon that goes in products through the development manufacturing production as well as shipping processes of a product. We can make higher quality products which are more efficient. We can make them more productively, more efficiency and use less energy materials and resources by improving these manufacturing projects using less waste um, throughout the process. And next slide, please. And um, we also want to, as I've said before, uh, reduce, reuse and recycle. We've funded projects which are looking to use less or even no magnets um, going into motors for cars, trains and wind turbines. Um, and we're funding projects that, that optimize components that give the same performance, but use less material and fewer resources. Um, we are looking at projects that fund recovering metals, magnets and other valuable materials components from stuff that's just thrown away from motors, speakers, hard drives and LED light bulbs. And there's not just environmental benefits for this, there, there's ethical and, and there's cost savings as well. Next slide, please. So here is how some of our funding has, uh, has gone out so far. Um, key things to look at here, we're about to announce the winners of our £22 million um, competition that's coming out in the next couple of weeks. And, and we've got a, a big drive at the moment with competitions in progress on boosting the PMD skills in the UK. So we have got the workforce to produce these PMD and components and products in the UK. And I think I'm just about out of time yet. So I'll, next slide, please. I'll thank you very much for listening. Please get in touch. And I will pass back um, to Amy for the Q&A session. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you to all of our speakers. I think we'll agree we've had some, a vast range of exciting sort of topics covered there. And I could ask the rest of the panellists if they could turn their cameras on and um, we can go to the Q&A. So I say, well, try and get through some of these in the next sort of 20, 25 minutes or so. So I see quite a few have come through already in the Q&A, but if any of the attendees have got any um, questions that have already just bubbled to the surface, please do add them and we'll try and get through as many of your questions as possible. So some of these I'll put to you individually, but um, if any speaker wants to come in and add some extra comments, then I'd also welcome that as well. So the first one, I think probably sort of Kim and Judith might have some sort of views on this one about Digital twins have been tended to be kind of in an individual or sort of a single manufacturer, sort of under control of one organization. What are the sort of the extra challenges now? This is work across multiple organizations um, and that may be sort of previously sort of otherwise unconnected. Kim, if I go to you first. Yeah, uh, absolutely key question. Um, and sharing of data and information is absolutely a challenge in um, many organizations um, or across different businesses. Um, and clearly um, when it starts to become sensitive, whether it's cost information, et cetera, then um, clearly there needs to be agreements uh, and standards around how that data is going to be shared and how who's gonna benefit from it or how, how is that benefit gonna be shared? Um, and so there's, there's lots of questions that, uh, that need to be addressed, but absolutely the technology is there to enable the sharing of information and the synchronization of networks. Um, but a key challenge, um, absolutely, as you've highlighted, is how do you get those agreements um, up front or standards up front? And I, I know that Judith is, um, has probably got a view on this as well, but the technology is there to enable it to happen. It's just then how you, you manage that sharing of information. The key thing is, um, as we've seen, moving away from cost data and actually carbon data does create a platform where people are more readily wanting and able to share or feel it's less sensitive. Um, so actually it's, it's enabled um, that to, to happen more readily. Um, that's certainly what I'm, I'm starting to see. Uh, Judith, I don't know if you want to jump in on some of that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. The um, first thing I would say is that it's important to make a distinction between sharing data and putting data into a digital twin, because actually we could share data now without a digital twin. Um, and that in, in itself would be valuable. And, and government has tried a few things around that with things like data trusts. And of course, um, a lot of us already share data with the ONS 
um, to produce things like the retail price index, for example, where you know we give we give the ONSR EPOS sales data, which has everything, and then and they calculate the retail price index. But these are kind of one-offs; they're not common practice. Um, but I think the, the real value in this, as we've described, is putting that data, as long as it's standardized and as long as it's equitable and it is real data, um, into a digital twin. And I think that's where the government's national digital twin infrastructure comes into play, where we do need digital twins to be built and they do need to be built centrally because they are of national importance and whether that's for a digital twin for energy for water for the food system um, that has to be owned centrally and I liken it to kind of roads and cars and bicycles and transports you know somebody builds the roads and we decide what we want to drive on that road and where we're going um, on that transport system and and it's the same with digital twins and data I mean so, just um sorry sorry no finish up finish what you're saying dude no, and uh, and I think one of the things that we've been looking at the Food and Drink Sector Council is just that with an idea called Feed UK. And just to Kim's point, Feed UK was a it's proposed to be a digital twin of the food system that enables things like CO2 shortages not to happen in the future because we understand where those points of interest are in the system and where those consolidation points are. Um, but um, you know, building a digital twin of the food system is uh, quite an expensive exercise. However, um, those things are, are got, have got to be the way forward. When we shared it, it wasn't the commercial information that was interesting. What people said was, and I think over a thousand people responded to the presentation of Feed UK, was that they would use it to get to net zero. That was their number one use of a digital twin of the food system was to get to net zero. So there you go. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, we had a sort of follow on question. People are asking for some good examples of traceability tools in supply chains where they're actually being used to drive net zero. I mean, dare I ask, is this the right place to ask about blockchain, whether we're seeing that as being an example? Is that one of those good in theory, but uh, not yet happening in practice. I was going to say, no, I'm not a good person to ask because I've had my fingers burnt on that one. Um, for for all, all the commercial reasons, actually, that Kim talks about is that there are points where people just don't want to share information from a blockchain perspective. Um, but there are other ways of doing it. They're a lot simpler and cheaper. Excellent. Has anyone else got any points on sort of traceability and uh, going across organisations of data? No. Excellent. We shall move on to the other questions. Uh, Neil, uh, similarly on tools, you talked about some sort of great tools you've got for different sectors there. Um, one question which uh, I think quite a few people who've used sort of tools in this space will be interested in. Is not the proliferation of tools itself adding to the problem because there's not one approach? Yep, um, for sure. I mean, it's a it's an industry build, building tools at the moment, and uh, everybody, uh, not everybody, there are many people building tools, and so a proliferation of tools is not hugely helpful. At the same time, none of the current set of tools quite does what people need so we're in that kind of phase i think where multiple things are being made multiple people are testing out multiple approaches and hopefully it'll be like you know betamax versus vhs videos and things that you know one one system one approach one standard will will rise to the top and we won't have to deal with quite so much complexity but we have got the complexity at the moment I've put a lot of um, comments into our internal chat here around, I mean, the main problem for the tool makers is the traceability down to a, a level where you can actually attribute something. So getting to the level of, you know, the field, the, the, the one kilometer grid square, the 10 kilometer grid square, where people are sourcing any of these products and being able to trace it through the supply chain, you can't really get a deforestation free supply chain or a biodiversity risk free supply chain if you don't know where you're getting stuff from. 
So I think that's an open challenge to everybody. I mean, blockchain has been proposed as one solution, and I heard that that's there's other technologies that can do it. I'd love to know what they are, um, because that's a fundamental problem. Is like you know, most companies don't really seem to know where they get stuff from, and I know that's a crude generalization, but I would pose it to everybody: is like, do you actually know exactly where you get stuff from? Therefore. Can you actually calculate your deforestation risk, your biodiversity risk, your social risk, or can you not? No, I mean, I'd say one thing I've sort of noticed, you know, a lot of people would know UKRI from just we fund projects. But I think it's worth saying as well, we do get involved in quite a lot of work with standards organisations. And I think this is one of those areas where standards are very good for setting the frameworks. It's not that everyone has to use the same tool, but as long as we can have common frameworks where the standards of what information will be transferred means that people can develop lots of different commercial tools, but it's, at least it's gonna be compatible. Kim, did you have something to add there? I, I totally, totally support what you say there, Amy. It, it's then a, a having a framework where in effect apps or tools can work together. Um, because no one um, organization will create the one monster perfect tool. It, it's just how do you then enable um, all of the, the sub elements to really effectively work together. And I know some of the big data companies are trying to look at solutions of how we can enable that to ha happen. Um, and then ha you've got the framework that you can bolt everything together. Excellent. Um, now I'm just going to move on. Oh, so Judith, have a quick one, I and then I'll say, move on. Because I, I quickly just add to that is that there's a really good example of where that happens, and that's with the global barcode standard. So you know, around the world, whether it's used for coronavirus vaccines or it's used on you know carrots or potatoes or whatever it might be, there is a global standard for a barcode that en enables you to put a geolocation number into that barcode for every person on that supply chain, which is a, a really neat and easy way of using an existing system and standard um, to be able to trace things through the supply chain or through the supply system. And um, global standards, GS1, in the UK are working on that with a thing called product DNA. So that might be something that people might want to check out. Just wanted to add on one final thing to that, Judith. I mean, it Absolutely, the area is around creating the data in the first place and making sure that you can see it. But then absolutely the key challenge that we're working with actually a, a, a data trace and track company is then how do you get insight from it? Because it's all well and good having the data, but if you can't get insight from it, what do you do with it? Exactly. Great. Okay, so we move on to some of the other questions then. So I think this one, Jeff, uh, will be a good target of this one. Some others may have views as well. Um, the question is, how are the latest range of biodegradable plastics impacting the supply and waste stream? Are they just contaminating it or are they a good addition? And I think this is an interesting example of kind of people solve one problem. Wouldn't it be great if plastics are biodegradable, but they've got to work in the whole system here? That's, that's a really good question because I think intuitively everyone would like to go to a bio-based system because you're keeping carbon in circulation. I think the challenges are that the system's that we currently have, which is our mixed waste collection systems, are not optimised for biodegradable waste. Um, yes, there are domestic waste collections, but we know that the, the, the um, some of this material is is only compostable in, in you know quite industrialised composting facilities, and certainly couldn't be composted at home. Um, the the and also, of course, it. it can spawn other behaviours that this material is okay to go in the environment because it will break down. And there's some lovely examples of carrier bags left in um, harbours for three years and still being perfectly good, even though the message on the outside of the plastic bag said it's biodegradable. I think in closed systems where you know this material is being collected, so let's say a festival, uh, for example, if you can separate the food and the biodegradable waste from other other material then and like plastic cups or whatever then yes you stand a chance of actually being able to re recycle that material back into some products or other whether that be a soil improver uh fertilizer whatever but the the problem is when we have a mixed waste system um you do end up contaminating the waste and another example i would give you from the plastics that we recycle is that um 20 years ago, we used to keep glass separate. Now we've all co-mingling the glass. Well, the glass going into one of our processes can damage the extruder. 
So we will be always looking to keep glass away from the plastics because the, pl the glass breaks and then becomes embedded in the plastic that goes into our process. So the sooner and the better we can separate out the waste streams going into waste processing, the more efficient and effective it'll be to be able to uh, achieve the resource we want out at the other end. Excellent. Okay, and we've had quite a few questions uh, focused on sort of Belinda's talk. Um, I'd like to sort of pick out one where um, it's been asked kind of as, as fertilizers are not good for the environment, would it be best to phase some of these semi-closed ecological systems? And you hinted at kind of the vertical farming one, but also with these kind of very novel approaches, what's the appetite sort of within sort of traditional farmers to sort of adopt some of these new approaches? Okay, so I'll take the second part of your question first. I think um, we're seeing a lot of appetite among farmers to change, to see new ways of working. They want clarity around regulation and standards and what's expected of them. But absolutely, there's a huge appetite for seeing innovation as the enabler. Almost, you know, we're almost at the risk of a bit of a hype curve, dare I say, because you know, the appetite and ambition that technology will solve problems uh, is something that will potentially come back to, to, to bite us. So I think the mindset is there. We have a lot of other enablers, as Judith talked about, you know, policy and regulation standards, all of that. Now to come to the controlled environment or semi-closed system, that's a very interesting one because part of the rationale around a closed system is that you need less water, you can control uh, inputs, you need less uh, fewer nutrients, things like that. So on the surface, it sounds a very good system and in some places it is and for some crops it is and I think that's the the key thing is that the calorific uh, content of most of the products that are being grown commercially at the moment is leafy salad and that's great there's a huge uh, market for that not without its challenges around logistics but there is a real potential there but there's some work has been done in Wageningen University which has looked at the energy calculation of having these kinds of systems um, in different parts of the world. And it depends on whether you're using a glass house and you've got a lot of natural light in certain parts of the world where you have a, a high light intensity, that's great. If you want to do it in sort of Northern Europe, perhaps not so great if you're then having to supplement with artificial light as well. And of course, heating. So it always helps if you're, uh, one of the big examples is the British Sugar Facility that has a, a big glass house next to it that's using a lot of the waste heat um, from the sugar beet processing. So I think the short answer to the question is, um, yes, it will have a role undoubtedly, semi-controlled, uh, semi-closed systems will have a role, but it's right place, right crop, right time. Excellent. And I think so, uh, one of the other questions you've been asked that, that sort of links back to what sort of Jeff was saying, and I think Judith might have some opinions on this as well. It's this trade-off between making products last long when on the shelf with foods that sort of go off and that being kind of the where the primary sort of carbon saving is to give sort of long life um, shelf life to products. But at the same time, we're often adding plastics to that in order to make that happen. And how do you kind of map what are there other technologies to make things last longer? And how do you manage that trade off? So, Belinda, if you've got a quick comment first, but I'd like to bring so Jeff and Judith have got opinions on this as well. Yeah, it is a trade off. And I think um, before COVID, I was hearing that uh, cucumber producers were saying if they can not, coat, not wrap cucumbers in plastic, um, that would be great. That's what consumer wants. But the reduction in shelf life of, of cucumbers that are not wrapped in plastic really means that the levels of waste uh, are just unacceptable. So I don't, I'm not an expert on this area, so I am gonna hand over to Judith, but I'm worried what COVID has meant in terms of the appetite around packaging and plastic, single use plastics uh, and extension of shelf life. So Judith, I'm going to defer to your expertise on this. <laughs> well, th thank you, Belinda. Um, you're absolutely right, actually. There was a massive increase in the sales of um, loose fruit and veg um, initially from the, the plastics um, sort of campaign and as soon as uh, covid kicked off that completely went into reverse and and customers simply don't want to buy unpackaged food um, that they think other people even though all of the communication has been around um, the fact that there is minimal risk um, but the good news on cucumbers and cucumbers is that iconic item because it's the one that everyone talks about um, there are some interesting businesses starting up um, 
in all over the world actually that are creating uh, natural substances from plant extracts that can create barriers to extend the shelf life and interestingly they have done some in North America um, done some work with these plant extracts on cucumbers that show that they can um, extend the life of a cucumber without plastic packaging. So again, innovation, suggesting for a minute that's the full answer, but it's definitely being used on cucumbers. Um, there's, I think some proposals for trials in the UK and definitely being used on citrus fruits out of Spain um, and South Africa. So I think there are things on the way, but probably over to you, Jeff, on that one. Thank you. I, rec I recall that the original driver for plastic around cucumbers was around uh, human health infections. It was, I think, driven by a sort of a dysentery outbreak in Germany. And I think that was, so it's interesting how this has morphed into extending shelf life. Maybe that was a secondary consideration that, that fell from it. I, I mean, I certainly welcome the innovation that's then being done, but, you know, there are, at the end of the day, some of these things are stop gaps, they're short term, and then a longer term, more sustainable solution comes through. I guess the, the, ch the challenge with plastics is, can we design a system so that once that single use plastic has finished its use, can that be uh, prioritised or preferentially placed in an environment where it can be readily collected and processed um, back into a hydrocarbon? The, the, the risk is that all this material ends up being downcycled because it's co-mingled with other contaminated material. And I think if you, I dare say, take the, 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 the film off a cucumber as, it, as it's first being used, that plastic is relatively clean in comparison say, to a yogurt pot or some other container that you may have used from your fridge. So it may be that we can actually do a lot, lot more in the house and also in the supply chain to better give that packaging a chance to be, to be recycled downstream some, some, some time on. Okay, now we're sort of coming to sort of a closing and, and when we get to sort of even close to the end, I'll give you sort of a minute or so just to kind of some of your sort of key points, but I just want to add a sort of one final question and we talk a lot about sort of the mitigation of climate change, reducing of carbon. The other important part when it comes to supply chains is adaptation and resilience because we've already baked in quite a lot of climate change and we're already seeing kind of disruptions, well, not just from climate change, but with other sort of geopolitical sort of instabilities. So kind of what challenges are you kind of seeing in your supply chains? Whereas previously we might have been just in time and everything kind of run as lean as possible in order to adapt to kind of this future world where we might have more disruptions. Does anyone want to come in on that one on resilience? I, would just, I was going to say that the, the point for me on resilience and, and adaptation actually is, is um, it's a bit like Neil's comment about, you know, the hidden parts of the supply chain. And I'm thinking now about smallholder growers and 35%, I think it is, according to um, the World Bank, of, of things like tea, coffee, cocoa, bananas, um, come from smallholder producers that are very difficult to see in our supply chains. And they're the ones that are going to be disproportionately impacted by climate change and the climate change they didn't help to create. So I think some of the things that we need to be really cognizant about, particularly, you know, when everybody expects to have a cup of coffee every day um, or a cup of tea and you know, everyone loves a piece of chocolate, that these supply chains are unbelievably vulnerable and not enough is being invested in making sure that not only short term resilience of those supply chains, but, but how we're going to help them adapt. And there's an interesting project at Kew on a third species of coffee called Stenophila, which is um, halfway between an Arabica and Robusta that grows in uh, higher temperatures and in droughtier conditions. So some of those things are going to be really important going forward. But, but we have a responsibility to those smallholders wherever they are in the world. And I, I don't think collectively um, and we're doing enough about that. Um, so, yeah. We Excellent. Right. Um, in the sort of final sort of five minutes or so, so I'm just going to, I know sort of Kim and Belinda wanted to come on this, but if you could uh, sort of do your sort of sum up, but if you want to include resilience in your sum up, that'd be more than welcome. So I'll go to you, Kim, first. Yeah, I mean, certainly just to add briefly, a key thing that COVID has taught a lot of supply chain leaders is how unresilient their supply chains are. 
and actually um, uh, the huge um, volatility both in demand and supply has given people a desire to at least understand um, how unresilient it is and what they can do about it. So what I'll say is um, there is a desire now to at least understand and then make some choices about what they're going to do. So the text there to support it, as I as I said before, which is, is a key part of my summing up, Amy, is um, people are more and more aware of what they need to do and the tech is there, but clearly there's some work needs to be done on standards uh, and aligning approaches um, because that is creating a barrier to move this forward. Great. Belinda? I guess I've been reflecting throughout, throughout this session around this concept of the circular economy, because we have lots of examples where there are businesses that are completely dependent. They, they've been promoting themselves as circular economy businesses, which is great. You know, black soldier flies are being fed citrus waste. Uh, cosmetics are being pigmented using the, the flavanols and the, the, the colored pigments from waste fruit. That's fantastic. But um, as we're seeing with the carbon dioxide situation, that interdependency that we've been talking about does, I think, throw the whole concept of the circular economy a bit into, uh, I think there's a bit of a paradox there that perhaps we just need to bottom out. While we're encouraging more interdependency between supply chains, uh, we are inherently kind of increasing the potential vulnerability as well. Thank you. Jeff, would you like to give your final thoughts? Well, first of all, it's been a fascinating uh, webinar and I've enjoyed all the views. I guess the, the bit about the circular economy is really close to our heart. We, we've seen a lot of conversations around sort of linear based systems in the past, but I think a recognition that we're all in this together and we all get the benefits then of, of all working together. I think the UK Plastics Pact has been particularly instrumental in joining up plastic manufacturers, uh, fast moving consumer goods uh, uh, manufacturers, retailers um, and then the oil majors as well to try and get that and the waste, waste management companies to, to try to join up and see that bigger picture um, but above all customers expect this now and regulators are now getting very interested and I didn't mention extended producer responsibility but EPR is really trying to drive that circularity so I think it's it's, it's incumbent us all see your place in in that um, uh, commercial environment and then recognize that people are looking in at you and see how you should be then performing to the best and influencing people upstream and downstream of you to do the best you can. Excellent. Okay, if I do go to Neil next, Neil Sum. Yep, um, two main challenges, I think. So one is the nation state. So the UK as a state understanding its, um, its supply chains and its the deforestation, the carbon, the biodiversity that's embedded in, in the entire kind of like economic system the UK um, runs. Um, and, and how is that going to be solved through uh, free trade agreements or trade agreements and, and all those, you know, things. So there's a regulatory kind of like role and what tools are necessary to help that. So one point. And the other is for, for companies running different kinds of supply chains if you're a fashion company, you know, understanding your cotton supply chain is a complicated business. Um, but unless you can kind of work out more or less where your cotton comes from, you can't really say much about, um, you know, the deforestation embedded in your pair of jeans um, or the loss of species that you are might be affecting by your by your production of a shirt. Um, so they're those two kind of levels of challenge, the business level challenge and the nation state level of challenge and the tools required to help um, those two levels of actors sort this out, I think is you know, what I'd like to focus on as being big societal challenges. And there are lots of you know, people working on it, technology companies are part of it, but full traceability is, is really the goal, I think right. somehow. Thanks. Thank you. And, and Mark, I appreciate you've been talking a lot about food supply chains, but any final words on um, kind of more the mechanical, mechanical sort of supply chains that you're dealing with? Yeah, thank you. Well, we, we're, we're part of the same supply chain. We are, you know, we, we, we are funding projects which develop the, the, the agri-tech robots, the machines that go into those, the electronics that go into those. We're all linked together. 
um for, for for the for the power electronics machines and drives industry this is a this is an opportunity where we are there's well publicized shortages of, of chips and components and delays there's um uh, environmental and ethical concerns with where our materials come from where our components come from and there's a concern with people losing their jobs as we're no longer making internal combustion engines here in the uk um, so, so on, on our journey to net zero, we, we can use it as an opportunity to, for, for a leg up um, for industry um, to be more, be more sustainable, uh, be more resilient by manufacturing in the UK, um, using better processes and this circular economy as well, which um, reduces our reliance on imports into the UK um, and at the same time reducing our waste as well. Excellent. Uh, Judith, any final quick seconds of uh, summary from yourself? Yeah, I suppose this is the, needs to be the collaboration of all collaborations, doesn't it, both globally and nationally, um, because we need to move at pace and scale. So I would pick a few things and give them laser like focus so that we can get on with it. So. I'll leave you with that thought. Excellent. So with our laser like focus, we shall bring to a close this wonderful webinar. Thank you so much for all your contributions, everyone. And thanks for those who've joined us live and those who've joined us sort of on the catch up as well. Um, if you've enjoyed today's session, I'd like to point out that the next session is the 19th of October on sustainable materials. So please visit the UKRI website to find out more and obviously to also see the recordings from the previous session. So thanks again to all and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.